Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about focus and concentration while driving. And this was, uh, the topic for tonight was actually brought on by a poll that I put up on the YouTube channel on the community tab there about uh, helping everybody uh, or asking people about being honest, what distracts them while they're driving. And one of the, uh, the options that I put in was other drivers actions and that was overwhelmingly the reason why other people were distracted so if you're just tuning in here let me know where you're from in the world which part of the world you're tuning in from uh ria's here anthony's here uh corey's here bricks for wheels he's the moderator and uh ria i've been watching mostly all of your videos thank you so much for your help ria you are most welcome uh, and you're hoping to get your uh, driver's license the next month. That's really awesome. Tommy's here as well. So focus and concentration is what we're talking about tonight in combination with driver distractions is what we're going to be talking about. And thanks, uh, Corey, for that, for the audio and video. And uh, i got a couple of things going on here with other projects and those types of things. So I'm trying to get my head around uh, concentration and focus on driving. And uh, as I said, if you're watching on the replay, if you're just tuning in, uh, let us know where you are in the world and where you're tuning in from. And uh, we launched a couple of weeks ago the 100K campaign, uh, which is our goal to help 100,000 drivers get their license in the next year, regardless of class of license, motorcycle, car, truck, bus, and air brakes. And so we're working on that as well. So Ria's from uh, Massachusetts in the U.S., one of the New England states on the eastern seaboard near the top. Uh, Michael got here on time. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome, Michael. Uh, it's great. Uh, Von Sita, Von Sita, hi there. Uh, so again, if you're watching on the replay or just tuning in, let us know where in the world you are. And uh, all of that is really great. So Von Sita is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Love uh, Chattanooga. Stephanie is from Minnesota. Bemidji. In Minnesota, I haven't. I don't know where that is. I'm gonna have to look that up. Jaden, how are you? Uh, do DMVs take a points off? If there's no left turn signal bulb activated, and your check engine light is on. Uh, uh, okay, I need to think about that for just a minute. Okay, question: Do DMVs take a points off? If there's no left turn signal bulb now. Jaden, when you're asking me that, are you talking about on the dash or are you talking about the signal light working on the back? Because if it's on the back, if the light's working, that's probably okay. If it's not working on the dash, uh, when they do their little uh, pre-trip inspection at the beginning before you go up for your road test, if it's not working on the dash, that's going to be all right as long as it's working on the back. So Kitty Cat's here from Manitoba. Hall phase is here. And I believe Hall Faze, you're in Toronto. Uh, Williams here, he's from King, Kingsports, Tennessee. And, uh, <laughs> and Hall Faze, no, you didn't really get a new video. I put a promotional video up for a, an air brakes webinar that I'm doing this week. So Kowal Jet is here. Uh, Jaden, the signal light working on the back. Okay, so Jaden, that should be all right. I can't see that being a problem. If it's not showing up on the dash, but it is actually working on the back, then you should be all right. Uh, Finky from Calgary. So we got a few people here. So that's awesome. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get right over to the presentation. I'll do that. And again, while I'm doing the presentation, I can't, uh, I can't answer questions, but I'll certainly come back at the end of the presentation and answer all of your questions about uh, driver distraction and focus and concentration. That's what I'm talking about today. So see if I get this up for you here. Oh, not really ready here I had a couple other things going on here so just bear with me for one sec here uh, view um, zoom in one more there we go and get rid of that all right PowerPoint nope this one Sorry about that delay there. Just about there. Just don't want to be in the, taking up all the thing. There we go. Okay, so focus and concentration. I'm talking about this tonight, and the reason I'm talking about this tonight is because of the poll that I did on the community tab this week, and I had an overwhelming response about what causes distraction for drivers, uh, electronic devices, uh, 
passengers in the vehicle and uh, the actions of other drivers. So most people overwhelmingly are distracted by other the actions of other drivers on the roadway. So we're going to talk about that. And so I'm Rick August. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I uh, have been a truck driver in the 1990s. I drove truck in Canada and the United States, mostly everything uh, east of the Mississippi. I did do a little bit of uh, team driving back and forth between Toronto, Ontario, and Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, and <laughs> I like to say that the cab of a truck is never big enough for two men's egos. So that didn't, that was short lived. That was only about three months. Uh, 1997, I became a licensed driving instructor with air brakes, tractor trailers, and those types of things. And I've been a driving instructor ever since. I uh, moved to Australia in 2002, early 2002 was January, and uh, went off to university there and did a graduate degree in legal history. For those of you who don't know, legal history is the study in policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise was in policing as it relates to traffic. As well, while I was in Australia, a year prior to going to university, I drove buses for Greyhound between Melbourne, Canberra, and Sydney, Australia. And I also did the Milk Run, which was uh, the run between Melbourne and Brisbane. It went up to Parks, New, New South Wales, which is in the outback. And uh, did that, and then I drove for V-Line as well, which is just a short run. I did that part-time while I was going to university. So I have a, a lot of driving experience, and probably a little more than most. And uh, if you're more interested in my sort of biography, it's over on my website. Uh, and Corey may be able to find that for you and put the link up for you on my full biography of sort of how I got started in being a driving instructor and how I went on to actually go to graduate school uh, because the questions I encountered were so interesting and pressing that I just kept going. So this week um, I am launching another part of this whole Smart Drive Test business and this is doing webinars. And this is a webinar for uh, CDL drivers who are going to be doing the air brakes. I'm going to advertise this a little more on Facebook and those types of things. I'm still sort of working out the technical issues of it. But it will be on Wednesday, the 18th of October at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So that's what time it will be. And I'll be talking about topics such as what are air brakes and how do air brakes work. Uh, why do you have to have an, uh, an air brake ticket if you're working towards a CDL license? Uh, I'll be talking about downhill braking and I'll be talking specifically about questions that you will encounter on an air brake test when you go to do the, the endorsement uh, for your CDL license because every jurisdiction across North America, doesn't matter what state you are in the United States, doesn't matter what province you are in Canada, all of these jurisdictions are teaching a 40 year old air brake and there's a lot of redundancies in the air brake course. Uh, for example, uh, manual front wheel limiting valves, uh, wig wags, uh, you know, trailers that don't have parking brakes. And most of this stuff just doesn't exist on modern air brake systems. So I'll be talking about a lot of that information that you have to have for the purposes of passing your CDL test. So that's Wednesday. Mark your calendars. Wednesday, 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time is the uh, webinar on air brakes. I'll be helping you with that. And I'll uh, put the, uh, the link to sign up for the webinar on the community tab once I get that all sorted out, probably tomorrow. Okay, as well, I mentioned the uh, 100K campaign. This is to help 100,000 drivers pass the road test the next year. And if you've been successful on passing your road test, then head over to the Smart Drive Test website. Corey, I'll put the link up for you as well on that and uh, register for that. You can also make a donation, a, a monetary donation. We're going to donate a significant amount of that money to people with disabilities to help them to take driving lessons and to uh, purchase equipment uh, that they need in order to be able to drive and operate a vehicle. So that's the 100K campaign that we're also working on. So case study. This is the case study. This is the poll that I put up three days ago. We had an overwhelming response uh, to the question of if you were perfectly honest, which of the following distracts you when you're driving? Electronic devices and telematics. And for those that you don't know, telematics are the screens inside modern cars that have GPS, they have your radio, your stereo, uh, you can watch videos, they have backup cameras, that's telematics. So telematics, the definition of that is sort of anything that is communicating in your vehicle over a distance. So you have access to social media and all those types of things on some of these vehicles and I have seen them that they do have them as well. So uh, passengers and conversation were another one and so electronic devices and passengers both came in at 22% which is interesting and the actions of other road users. And of course, this poll is not definitive in any way. It wouldn't hold 
you know, statistical water, so to speak. Uh, but it is a fairly decent indication of one of the responses. And I mean, I could play around with this and do some A-B testing and change the responses and whatnot. But overwhelmingly, a lot of people are distracted by the actions of other drivers on the roadway, which ties in with my theory that driving is a social activity and many people get bent out of shape because of what other people are doing and they kind of have difficulty focusing on what they're doing because they're distracted by, oh, that person just cut me off or that person is tailgating me or this or that or whatever other infraction that they think other people on other road users are doing on the roadway. So it, it's an interesting topic and it's something that I wanted to talk about. And again, I wanna revisit some of these reasons why we have traffic crashes. And these are the top three reasons for traffic crashes. Speeding, failing to yield, and following too close. And of course, speeding does not lend itself to an easy definition. Uh, speeding, driving faster than the posted speed limit, driving faster than me, so you're driving at the traffic flow and then somebody passes you, they're obviously speeding. Uh, driving faster than the traffic flow is another one. Uh, and then driving faster than the conditions of the roadway will allow. So there's different types, different definitions of speeding. Failing to yield, people refuse to give up the right of way, and then following, following too close. And again, this number three reason comes back to my professional opinion that space management is the key to defensive driving and remaining crash free. Because as I say, if you are not near anything, you're not going to hit anything. And then of course, uh, most of us would be very much distracted by the Terminator uh, pointing an RPG at us, a, a rocket grenade RPG. Rocket grenade, <laughs> I can't think of it off the top of my head. A missile launcher, right? We'd all be distracted by that. So there we go. Okay, so distracted driving. What is the definition of distracted driving? And, def and the definition of distracted driving is any activity that takes our attention away from the driving task whether that is passengers in the vehicle, whether that's electronic devices, the actions of other road users, uh, something in the driving landscape that's taking our attention. For example, one uh, smart driver said that uh, people waving signs on the side of the road was distracting while they were driving. So that all of that can be distracted driving. It just It's not just cellular and mobile phones, one and the same thing, I just said it in two different languages. Uh, but for the most part, when, when we think of distracted driving and we think of the campaigns against distracted driving, most of that comes down to the use of cellular phones and texting while we're driving. But it's a lot of other things as well. Playing with the radio, dealing with our kids in the back seat, all of that is distracted driving. So, all of these things which I just talked about are electronics and telematics, mobile phones and GPS. Uh, noise in the vehicle. Noise can be extremely distracting if you go past a construction site or something like that and somebody's jackhammering, it's gonna be incredibly distracting. If you have emergency vehicles with sirens on, that is going to be incredibly distracting while you're driving because uh, emergency vehicles, let's just take that as, as a study and, and an example of distraction while you're driving because you're looking for the emergency vehicle, you're trying to figure out whether the emergency vehicle is coming up behind you and where you need to go and where you need to move. So in response to other road users, i.e. emergency vehicles, you are going to be distracted. Fatigue and emotional distress are also going to contribute to distraction because if you're tired, you're not going to be paying full attention to your driving. Uh, emotional distress, uh, say for example, you had a, somebody died in your family or your parents got divorced or something like that, you're going to be distracted distracted and other drivers too because of these reasons are also going to be distracted. Impairment, uh, illegal drugs, uh, alcohol or prescription drugs and medications uh, and this may come as a surprise to some of the smart drivers but prescription medication and over-the-counter drugs are the number one abused substances that cause impairment for drivers so know that. Uh, that many people who are driving motor vehicles are taking prescri prescription medication and over-the-counter drugs and they are impaired while they're driving. And again, we, uh, what one of the smart drivers said, things in the landscape, <laughs> good-looking uh, people of the same or opposite sex walking down the road, oftentimes we can be distracted by that, we can be distracted by billboards, we can be distracted by people waving signs around on the side of the road. So all of this our distractions in our driving environment and our driving landscape. And I'm gonna give you some techniques and strategies uh, near the end here too, so just 
bear with me for a minute while I define sort of the bigger problem. Passengers was one of the options for the poll. Passengers talking to you in the vehicle can distract you. And this is the reason that GLP programs, the graduated licensing programs, limit the number of passengers that young drivers, new drivers are allowed to have in the vehicle because passengers are distracting, especially at night. If you've been out partying or you've been out having a good time, you get four or five teenagers in the car and they're all going to be talking to each other. They may be getting a ruckus on and slapping each other and smacking each other. They are going to cause distraction on the part of the driver who doesn't have a great deal of experience. And this isn't just experienced drivers. I've had drivers that I've retrained uh, working with hand controls and driving lessons and those types of things where I do what I called my distraction lesson where I would talk to them the entire time that we were out in the car and doing a driving lesson. Now obviously, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't do this right at the beginning of our driving lessons. I would wait. So say we had 10 driving lessons on lesson number nine, I would have my distraction lesson where I would just talk to them through the entire uh, driving lesson even when they're doing complex maneuvers by doing left hand turns and those types of things are merging onto freeways and whatnot because I wanted to determine if the driver was able to tune me out and this is one of the other things that you need to do when you're driving you need to tune out passengers you need to tune out other distractions on the roadway and this is one of the strategies that comes with experience it's, it's experiential as you get more exposure to driving and you do more driving you're able to tune out and focus in on what's absolutely important left hand turns for example there's a lot going on in the intersection you're able to focus in on the oncoming traffic and be absolutely sure that the oncoming traffic is coming to a stop before you proceed to execute your left hand turn and that's what you have to be able to do when you're driving to avoid distractions and being distracted by other drivers and other road users behavior in the driving environment all right so one of the other things that will help you out and equip you to deal with other drivers missteps or uh, mistakes in the driving environment is to know that other drivers are going to make mistakes they're not going to be perfect you're not perfect when you're driving I am certainly not perfect when I drive I have made mistakes and driving authorities one of the Smith space cushion system Harold Smith who came up with the Smith space cushion system he said that people make approximately two mistakes in their driving every mile of driving so that's a lot of mistakes you're making a lot of decisions while you're driving so it's it, it's almost it should be the norm that you're going to expect other people to make mistakes and most of the time when people make mistakes while they're driving they're not doing it intentionally when senior drivers pull out in front of you they're not doing it intentionally it's because they have physical limitations on their ability to drive and they're simply pulling out because they think the way is clear uh, they shouldn't they probably shouldn't be driving but they're not doing it intentionally some drivers are doing it intentionally and some drivers will seek revenge and when that happens as I say to drivers you don't have to engage if somebody else is trying to cut you off or get in front of you or those types of things just let them get in front of you and take and you know and back off and let them go you need it's difficult because we have an emotional response we have a visceral response that we get angry inside of our cars and you need to work on that and just say well whatever and back off and let them let them carry on with their day and the reason that we become we react so uh, aggressively when other people do that is just because we're in this little metal box that is our personal space it's like in our houses we express our most raw emotions when we're by ourselves in a personal space and when we're in a car it's even more uh, confined and we're even in a smaller space than we are in our houses and we become comfortable in that emotions become exaggerated when are in our car everybody has experienced being angry in their vehicle and if you haven't yet there's a time it will come where you will get really angry in your car and you will be more explosive than you normally would be because I think it's you know I, I would posit that it's because uh, you're confined in a very small space and 
people react impulsively and watch the video on my biography there about Mr. Wheeler and Mr. Walker where Mr. Walker is this passive, you know, congenial person and then when Mr. Walker gets in the car and becomes Mr. Wheeler, Mr. Wheeler is this kind of devil, you know, take all revenge kind of on the world and a lot of people, I've had friends who are like that, they're just lovely people but when they get in a car and they start driving, oh my god, look out. So, and as I said previously, not all other drivers' mistakes are always intentional. They make mistakes, somebody may cut you off, they didn't even know that they cut you off and you lose the rest of your day because you got upset because somebody cut you off. They may not even have known that they cut you off. They just made a mistake and didn't even know that they did that mistake, but you lost your whole day because you're invested in what their mistake was. So know that it's not always going to be intentional. Sometimes, yes, it is going to be intentional, but not always. Okay, some of the ways that you're going to be able to keep yourself out of trouble and keep yourself calm and not reacting to other drivers' mistakes is by looking ahead at controlled intersections, predicting traffic patterns, looking into turning lanes, looking out for rubberneckers and out of the ordinary, and again, other road users' actions, rubberneckers, traffic crashes on the side of the road, emergency vehicles, and those types of things studying the characteristics of other vehicles on the road and what road users are doing knowing that big trucks are going to go slow going uphill they're going to slowly accelerate off uh, off the line at intersections and those types of things motorcycles summer vehicles rvs and those types of things a lot of people driving these big rvs don't have a great deal of experience also they're bigger they're going to accelerate more slowly they're going to brake more slowly over a longer distance and those types of things. So if you start to study the characteristics of other vehicles, you're going to be able to predict traffic patterns. And when you can predict traffic patterns, you're going to be less distracted by the actions of other road users. And again, it comes back to space management. If you have a big space buffer around your vehicle, it's less likely you're going to be right up on these people when they're making mistakes. So strategies and techniques that you can put in place space management do not be this red car <laughs> i say to students all the time one of the places that you can always manage space on your vehicle is in front of your vehicle you can always manage space to the front and you should be at least two to three second following distance and the reason that we use time as opposed to distance is because it's relative and <coughs> excuse me as you increase in speed, the distance following behind the other vehicle increases as well. As I said previously, if somebody else cuts you off or somebody does something intentionally, do not engage. You don't have to engage. And one of the best strategies in life is not to engage with other people who are trying to get you to go. Because what happens is that they ramp it up a little bit, you ramp it up a little bit more, they ramp it up a little bit more and the next thing you know you're into a road rage situation and you don't want to be in a road rage situation just let them go off and have their crash somewhere else it's also a mind set, setting your mind right in an attitude about driving that driving is not a race it's not about you know that that saying that <laughs> if you ever noticed that people who drive faster than you are goofballs and people who drive slower than you are are boneheads you know, we think that we're always right and it's sort of us against the rest of the world. It's not you against the rest of the world. Driving is a social activity and you need to know that other people are going to make mistakes. And if you can put your head around that and you can drive and have good space management, you're going to be more relaxed when you're driving and you're not going to be distracted by other drivers. And the last technique that I don't have here but I'm going to tell you is, is that don't play other people's games. Focus on what you're doing when you're driving. Focus on managing your space, focus on your maneuvers, focus on your technique while you're driving. And if you can focus on what you're doing, it's going to reduce the amount of distractions by the mistakes of other drivers in the driving landscape. And that slide keeps coming up. So that's some of the things about uh, focus, concentration, know that other drivers are going to make mistakes manage good space around your vehicle if you manage good space around your vehicle and you know that other people are going to be distracting you know what the distractions are going to be whether they're electronics uh, fatigue impairment uh, signs on the roadway people walking on along the roadway those types of things 
then you're going to be better equipped to not be distracted by other people on the roadway. So we can have a conversation about that. We can talk about distractions and talk about some of the strategies and techniques. And some of you, the smart drivers, will have some really good ideas about how we can uh, compensate for that and how we can improve our ability to focus on what we're doing and concentrate on our driving. All right, so just come back over here. Uh, bear with me while I change this transition back here and I'll answer all your questions. There we go. All right, so we're back. All right, so lots of questions here. <clears throat> there we go. Corey was trying to tell me what RPG stand for. Rocket Propelled Grenade. <laughs> <laughs> and all phase as well, so that's great. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was having a kind of a brain cramp about that. So, there we go. Thanks, Hall Phase. Yeah, the 100K, I got that done. I just need to get that an animated so I can put it into the new videos uh, and uh, have have that going on as well. So, yes. Okay. So, lots of people here. There's the biography. Corey put that up. Uh, Zacharias is from New York. That's great. Uh, and you're doing well. Uh, Bur Barasha, uh, I am in Vernon, British Columbia, which is in the interior. It's about four, four and a half hours north, northeast of Vancouver here on the west coast in Canada. Penny's here. Ellie's here. Uh, is G drive test same as G2? Uh, no, it is, Ellie, it is the same. The G2, uh, the G is the same, except for the G, they expect a little bit more experience and knowledge. So they want you to be smoother on the primary controls. They want you to be smoother on the steering, the braking, and the throttle for the purposes of passing a G test because they expect you to have some uh, experience at that point that you can do that. All right, uh, Jasmine's here. And K is from Edmonton. Hall phase is doing well. Excellent. Uh, whenever I go for my road test, I'm so scared. I've done it twice. Now I'm scared to go and do it again. So you got to focus on your breathing, K, and you're going to do well. All right. Okay. So we got all that. Boncita, I just finished my driving classes Thursday, so now I've got to do my driving sessions now. Three times the road test will be last Tuesday. Uh, is one of my driving sessions for two hours. I'm in driving school. Excellent. There you go. Okay. Uh, no, Barasha, I don't have a driving school. I actually do every, all my training online. So if you're interested, uh, Barasha, I have passed your road test first time. It's a course. It's an online self-paced course uh, over at the Smart Drive Test website. If you put in the coupon YouTube30, uh, or send me an email, I'll give you a discount on the course for 30%. So, okay. There we go. Uh, telematics and passengers in the vehicle. Yes, that is definitely distracting. Douglas, uh, Anita's here as well. And again, if you're watching on the replay, you just tuned in, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from in the world. That's really great. Von Sita, how to prevent a head-on collision when someone might go in your lane, drunk driving. Yes. Von Sita, one of the things you want to do is if, and that's that's a really good question in terms of head-on collisions. Now, if you are in a situation where you're going to encounter a head-on collision, uh, there's a few things that you want to do, okay? So first of all, for those of us driving on the right side of the road, you always want to move to the right. If you're driving on the left side in the world, if you're in the UK or in Malaysia or in Australia, you always want to move to the left. So whichever side of the road you want to move, you whatever side of the road you drive on, that's the side of the road you want to head for to avoid a potential head-on crash. The other thing you want to do is you want to uh, look for an opening. You want to try and aim for that opening. You don't want to, don't get locked on the car that's coming towards you and drive into that car because when we are... Uh, looking for an out and we're trying to get out of an emergency situation we're gonna go where we're looking so look for the opening don't look at the vehicle that's coming towards you the next thing is is that if a crash is imminent try not to hit the car head-on try to get off on a little bit so that you can reduce the amount of impact finally if you're gonna hit something and you can avoid hitting the car but hit something else don't hit a telephone pole don't hit a tree don't hit a rock Okay, aim for something small, aim for a fence, aim for a bush, aim for a hedge or something like that. Something that is going to be softer than hitting that car or hitting something solid like a tree or whatnot. Okay, so those are some of the tactics that you can put in place. As well, try to reduce your speed as much as possible. So get on the brakes and hit the brakes as hard as you can. Uh, if a crash is imminent, that way you're going to reduce the amount of uh, damage that's done 
to your vehicles. Now, the other good news is that in the last 20 or 30 years, we've made cars, uh, they're safer in that type of collision because most of the front end of the vehicle is an impact crumple zone. So it's, the car is going to be destroyed, but the, the passenger compartment of the vehicle is going to remain more or less intact and you're going to be safe if you're wearing your seatbelt and your airbags on and those types of things. Now, in most cases, I'm not going to say in all cases, but in most cases, that's going to help you out in the event of an imminent front end collision. Okay, Patrick, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? You were just there. <laughs> Uh, Vinny, no problem on being late. Uh, do you make mistakes and you're a good driver from what I've seen and you don't get angry? <laughs> well, I, I do once in a while get angry, Patrick. Uh, I used to be a cab driver, so there are times that I can have a go at people. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? What planet are you from? So yes, I do have my moments. Uh, I try not to put them on video, but yes, I do have my moments that I don't get upset. But for the most part, and the other thing um, is that uh, I drove truck as well. So, you know, uh, you, you tend to stay back and manage the space around your vehicle. So it's a lot better. Von Sita, a lady lost her son in 2011 from a head-on collision from a drunk driver. The drunk driver went in, uh, yeah, speeding. Yes, so uh, yeah, that's that's terrible. And unfortunately, the, uh, drunk driving is one of those times. And the other thing, Von Sita, about that in terms of drunk drivers, it's not always the case, but there is a time of day that you're going that you're more likely to encounter drunk drivers, and that's going to be you know sort of 11 o'clock at night till kind of two or three in the morning. If you're driving at that time and you get other vehicles, you know you look farther down the road, you see where the vehicles are wandering in their lanes, uh, they are driving unpredictably, and those types of things. That's going to give you some clues to what other people are doing. And especially as senior drivers are becoming more to the point and have a lot of dementia, you know, drunk drivers and those types of things, all of that is going to give you some clue about what other drivers are doing and that you're going to begin to manage space around your vehicle and you're going to compensate for those other drivers, excuse me, who could potentially deviate into your lane. Uh, what is, what was the biggest distraction between 1990 and 2000? Uh, Interesting enough, Hall Face, that none of this distracted driving really came on board till the middle of the first decade of the 2000s. Uh, I was interviewed in 2006 when I was at the university as a professor, and that was really when the government initiative came on board to start these distracted driving campaigns. Uh, and it really has launched now with, you know, prolific use of cell phones. I mean, almost everybody now, I would say... <laughs> that 90% of the population in North America has a cell phone and they're all using uh, cell phones in their cars despite what people might say whether they're using their cell phone or they admit that they're using cell phones I mean there was a study five or six years ago by the AAA in, in the United States the American Automobile Association and 33% of Americans admitted to using their cell phone while driving uh, no, sorry, 66% of Americans admitted to using their cell phone while driving. 33% of Americans uh, admitted to texting while driving. So if people are saying that they're not, they're not talking on their cell phones or, dry, or texting, uh, that's simply not true. And I mean, it's, now it's even worse because most of these cell phones have access to social media as well. So they're not just talking or texting on their phones. They're also engaging in social media. So it's, it's a bigger problem than I think people would like to admit. But we have so many other things in our vehicles too that are distracting us. So uh, it's difficult to sort of pin down the whole thing. Uh, Sebastian, taking my road test soon, often have panic attacks and anxiety in the road, but your videos helped. Although I haven't passed yet, I have confidence and I'm ready as ever. That's, that's excellent, Sebastian. And just remember to breathe. You know, and continue your mantra. Tell yourself, I can do this. I'm a safe driver. All of that will help you out and you'll be successful on your road test. And just continue to practice, okay? Uh, breathe, breathe, breathe. Yes, Tommy, uh, this is off topic, but I live in the U.S. And here anyone can rent a U-Haul when you are moving. My question is, how come you don't need any kind of CDL to drive a moving truck? Do you know why? Yes, I do know why, Tommy. Uh, Tommy, it's because of the weight Furniture doesn't weigh that much. Uh, furniture is a volume thing, uh, and oftentimes you're going to, it's what we call in the industry, you're going to cube out before you weigh out, which means that you're going to run out of space in the truck before you're overweight. 
and because of the weight that's the reason why you don't have to have a CDL license to drive a U-Haul vehicle. Uh, Vinny, what are the main driving skills to practice before a G2 test? Uh, Vinny, so the four components of any road test, Vinny, speed management, space management, observation, communication. Those are the four pieces that you need in place to be successful on any road test. So speed management. Posted speed limit, flow of traffic, whichever is less. Those are the two things you need to do in terms of speed management. And yes, in residential areas and other places where, say, for example, you're going through an area where there's high pedestrian traffic or there's cars parked on both sides and the road is narrow, narrow, yes, you can go a little bit slower. But for the most part, you want to try and get up to the posted speed limit as quickly as possible. Have a look at the video here. Corey will get that up for you on the mock road test. You'll see that when I'm driving in the uh, residential areas that I rarely get up to 50 kilometers an hour, 30 miles an hour. Uh, it's often because I just can't get up to speed and I'm in residential areas and I'm turning and those types of things. So you want to try to get up to speed as quickly as possible. Space management for the purposes of a road test. Don't get near any fixed objects. Don't get near other road users. And that way you're going to be safe and it's also the basis of defensive driving. So space management, stop at the correct position at stop signed intersections before the stop line, before the crosswalk line or sidewalk. If there aren't either of those, then stop at the edge where the two roads meet. When you stop in traffic, stop behind the vehicles in front of you so you can see the tires of that vehicle making clear contact with the pavement. Following distance is always two to three seconds behind other traffic. And as I said prior, it's relative. So as you increase in speed, the space between you and traffic in front of you is going to open up. Uh, space management, there's one other thing that I wanted to say. Right, pedestrians, you and pedestrians, you need one lane of buffer between you and pedestrians before you turn right or you turn left. So for example, if you're waiting to turn right and there's a pedestrian there and they're going across the roadway away from you, they need to be at the center of the roadway. And there's a video here as well that Corey will put up for you <coughs> on pedestrian. If they're coming towards you, you're gonna need a lot more space. So judge that and have a bit of discretion in terms of space management. Uh, communication. You need to communicate effectively with other traffic of your intentions. We communicate via the lights, signals, horn, uh, eye contact, uh, hand gestures, appropriate hand gestures. Don't tell other people that they're number one on a road test. <laughs> and the position of your vehicle. All communicate your intentions to other road users. And then finally, you have to observe correctly while you're driving. And you have a scanning pattern in place far down the road. Look at your mirrors far down the road. Instrument panel down on both sides. So you have to have a scanning pattern in place. Every time you make a turn or you move the vehicle laterally or lane change, you have to shoulder check. And you shoulder check twice before you turn or shoulder check twice before you make a lane change. Uh, when you're reversing for slow speed maneuvers, you have to do a 360 degree scan before you back in and you have to look out the back window while you're reversing. And if you're going to do another 360 degree scan for approximately every vehicle length, then do another 360 degree scan. So that those are the four components of any road test, regardless of class, regardless of where you are in the world. Speed management, space management, observation and communication. That's what you need to do. All right, uh, Jerry, I lost you. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Okay, lost. There we go. Uh, any difference of taking driver's license between Quebec and Ontario? Uh, Jerry, for the most part, it's the same in Quebec as it is in Ontario. There's a few minor differences, but for the most part, it's going to be the same. And those four basic components are going to be the same in Quebec as they are in Ontario. Fica, fica yo. Uh, ran a red light recently, was distracted by my thoughts and didn't stop till I crossed the light. What should I do to keep focus always to avoid a reoccurrence? Okay, so this is one of those excellent points of distracted driving that yes, we get distracted. Now what I would suggest is, is that we, we're all going to get distracted. And the other thing that I didn't talk about in the presentation about concentration and distraction is, is that... There's two sides of our brain. There's the right side of our brain and the left side of our brain. The left side of our brain is the very rational side, the very logic side. The right side of our brain is the spatial orientation, uh, artificial time, relativity, and all those types of things. And the artists talk about drawing on the right side of the brain. There's actually a book called that. And 
we need both sides of our brain to be able to drive but a lot of times what happens is, is that when we're driving spatial orientation so we're driving down a roadway and there's several cars and we are using the right side of our brain to determine relative distance between us and other road users and fixed objects on the roadway what happens is, is that the right side of the brain does is not able to comprehend artificial time so and artists talk about this people who draw or do music or those types of things that when the right side of the brain takes over it loses track of time and most of us who are veteran drivers can reiterate situations where we've been driving and we don't remember the last 10 minutes of driving and that's the reason that's because the right side of the brain has taken over and loses track of artificial time so this is what you're talking about fikio i'm sorry if i'm sorry i'm not saying that right but what we need to do is we need to train ourselves where we need to pay attention when we're driving so in terms of the intersection and got distracted what you need to say to yourself is I'm coming up to an intersection I need to pay attention now I need to draw my focus back and I need to concentrate and this is one of the things that helps with experience as you become as you drive more and more is, is that you learn where you need to have your focus and where your focus needs to be pointed to uh, when you're driving and that's one of the things that can help you with that all right Jasmine yes you can take the course Patrick focus focus breathe breathe yes Sebastian <laughs> you're most welcome uh, Buffalo Minnesota excellent uh, Jelani uh, since I told you about how gifted I am with my vision and all I wrote down this handy tip for driving it's not a race always manage speed and space hey that's a great mantra <laughs> Jano uh, I have my G test tomorrow and ever since I first started to learn how to drive I've used your videos as a stepping stone to learn how to drive I'd like to thank you Jano you are most welcome and thank you for that compliment that's really great and uh, good luck on your test tomorrow be sure, be sure to drop back and let us know uh, Michael, I think Nancy Reagan tried getting rid of those big advertising signs on the freeway back in the day. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to see if I can find anything about that, Michael. Uh, Hall phase, did you see the marketplace report that said it's easy to get a CDL in Canada except in Ontario? Uh, what do I think about that? Um, let, let me think about that for a minute, Hall phase, and see whether that is or not. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Reese uh, used your videos to pass my driving test, but once you receive your license, you learn most people don't follow the road rules. Uh, Reese, we know as driving authorities that most people uh, resort to social driving within three months. That people who get their license do not follow the traffic rules. But one and one and again, road rules no longer pre no more prevent traffic crashes than criminal law prevents crime. So. Just know that other people are not going to, you know, they're going to subscribe to social driving. They're going to do what other people are doing in the driving environment. They're not going to stop completely at stop signs. They're going to keep up with the traffic flow. Uh, they're going to follow too close. They're going to stop too close to traffic in front of them, those types of things. But one, of the, one technique and strategy that I would like to encourage you to keep in place, yes, you can keep up with the traffic flow and you can, uh, you know, go fast when you're driving and those types of things manage space around your vehicle when you get boxed in by other vehicles on the roadway you should feel uncomfortable when you're driving and you should start to bristle because when you're near other things the risk of being involved in a crash increases exponentially so manage space and have a buffer of space around your vehicle and as well as I tell students all the time it's faster much much faster to drive out of an emergency situation than it is to brake but you need space into which to drive so know that for the purposes of a road test um, okay uh, Vinny thank you I'll keep those components in mind excellent uh, da -da -da. Vansita, I'm in Tennessee and turning red on red is illegal. Okay, so, um, and you're in Chattanooga, right, Vansita? So you can't turn red right on a red. And that's the same in New York City in the five boroughs. You can't turn right on a red light. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, uh, I think the biggest distraction is the action of other drivers. And my second biggest is probably the landscape. Yes, <laughs> Christopher's here. Uh, Tommy Lund, what is a G-test? A G-test is the second phase of the passenger vehicle license in Ontario. So in Ontario, it's 
uh, G1, G2, and a full G license. So G1 is the learner's phase, uh, G2 is the novice phase, and then G is a full license in Ontario. Uh, Jerry, thank you, you are most welcome. Uh, 380, I had a dollar every time I magically appeared in a place during a drive, wake up in a rest stop, and need to check GPS and clock. <laughs> yes, 380, I remember those days of driving truck when I woke up in the morning and I'm looking out the window going, where am I? <laughs> uh, Tommy, do you have any videos on Class B? Class B, uh, Tommy, just remind me, is Class B school bus uh, where you are there? Yes, Vencita, Jaden, I'm playing, that's a game and I'm helping the police chase down a suspect I told the pickup truck that they were fleeing in. <laughs> that's great, that's great, awesome there. Epic, uh, I had a night drive on an interstate and the way to be focused for these late night drives on an interstate is probably stick to the middle lane and use a vehicle in front as a guide. Do you watch your guides? Yes, and Epic, that is a really good technique and strategy for driving on freeways at night to be behind another vehicle because as I say, in the night driving vehicle and for other drivers, uh, when you're driving at night is to follow other traffic because most of the time, at least we hope, other traffic is going to drive on the roadway. So if you follow the traffic as well, uh, other traffic can be, uh, you know that there aren't any animals on the roadway. It's not such a big deal on interstates and freeways and those types of things because oftentimes there's barriers that prevent animals from being on the freeway. However, on highways and rural uh, places that pass through rural areas, there's gonna be animals that could potentially come out on the roadway. And if you're following another vehicle, you know that there aren't animals because there's somebody in front of you. So that's gonna help you out when you're driving at night uh, and finding the roadway. And again, like you said, Epic, driving in the middle lane gives you a buffer of space because you have a lane on your right and a lane on your left that's going to keep you out of trouble when you're driving. You have some place to go in the event of emergency. You can go right or left because you have some space uh, to drive into and it's quicker in an emergency situation to drive out of that situation than it is to try and brake, especially in this day and age with ABS, because ABS is ABS brakes, anti-lock braking systems, which most vehicles have, are not going to stop in a really short distance, all right? Adrian, your videos have helped me a lot. Thank you, you are most welcome. Uh, Jasmine, when I take my road test and pass, can you put me on the map for people who pass their driving test? Absolutely, Jasmine. We're definitely going to put you on that. And we also ask when you pass to uh, register with the 100K campaign. And yes, that's the other thing that we do. And Corey will find that for you, the link for the map of success. I have a Google map that I operate that I put all of the drivers that tell me that they pass the road test on because I ask them where they are from in the world and I put them on the map of success and everybody gets their thing. And I put your little, uh, when you, what you told me when you passed your road test, I put that on there as well. Uh, Michael, no, uh, Jasmine, yes, Michael, yes. At night, especially when it rains, it just kicks back behind a big rig and jammed to some tunes, especially when the paint lines are faded. Yes, definitely. I know what you're saying, Michael. Really good. Frank, how is Frank in the thumb of Michigan? Excellent. Just got out of work at Kroger's. Lots of truck deliveries there. I'm in the meat department. That is really great. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to come down and see you, Frank. When I'm home in Ontario at one point, I'll drive down to Michigan and come and see you. Uh, like a dump truck. Oh, okay. No, straight truck like a dump truck. Tommy, uh, yes, uh, just about, now one of the things about Tommy about getting a CDL license that I will say this to everybody who's getting a CDL license, a commercial driver's license, that everything in class five, what we call class five or G passenger vehicle is applicable to trucks and buses. So 80% of what I teach in car is also applicable to trucks and buses. The only thing that's different is, is that obviously you're not gonna have to parallel park a truck. There may be some places you might have to, but uh, you're gonna have to learn how to shift and you're gonna have to le learn to do air brakes. So all of the stuff on air brakes is going to be applicable there, Tommy, for a uh, straight truck for you. Uh, where, uh, where are you, Tommy, in the world that uh, class B is straight truck? Where is that? Because uh, I'm used to class D being straight truck. That's from Ontario and uh, that's probably one of the states, okay? 
No logic. Okay, there's the map of success that we're going to put you on, Jasmine, when you get your license. So that's what we're going to do. All right, so thank you, everybody. We're rolling up on the 50 minutes here. So we're going to, if you got a couple more questions, we're more, more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, if you're just tuning in or you're watching on the replay, be sure to let us know where you are. Uh, if you've passed a road test in the last couple of weeks, be sure to let us know. Be sure to stop over at the website and let us know that you were successful in passing a road test and good luck for anybody that is coming up on a road test in the next couple of weeks and be sure to drop back and let us know and for those of you going for a CDL license Wednesday 18th of October 2018 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time we're going to be doing a webinar on air brakes and give you some really good information about that and we're going to offer you uh, the course that I have over at the website <clears throat> excuse me give you a discount on that as well and uh, put together a really good package that will help you out and be successful on passing your CDL license and starting a career as a truck or bus driver or for the RV drivers <laughs> uh, being able to drive that new vehicle and uh, be safe going up and down the road. So uh, Von Sita, how do you fail a road test? Uh, most of the time Von Sita, most people do not commit a dangerous action. If you commit a dangerous action you pull out in front of another vehicle or you speed for an excessive amount of time that will cause you to be unsuccessful on a road test, but most people just demerit out. They're not ready, they're not uh, smooth on the controls and those types of things. Their tunes are too wide or too slow. Uh, that will generally cause you to uh, be unsuccessful on a road test. Uh, Andrew, is it safe for a new driver to drive a large SUV like an Escalade? Yes, it is, Andrew, and Corey will get up the video on Learn to Drive. Now, the other thing I would suggest, Andrew, if you're not uh, comfortable with a large SUV, then go into the parking lot and maybe even go down and rent some of those pylons before you go into the parking lot and just get used to handling it. Be comfortable with the, uh, the primary controls and get used to where the vehicle is in space and place. You can do it, and it's easy to do, but uh, just take a bit of time and be comfortable with the vehicle and get used to where all the primary and secondary controls are on the vehicle. Von Sita, how do you pass a road test? What I would suggest Von Sita is to go back in the video <laughs> and listen to the four components. Space management, speed management, observation and communication. That's what you need to do to be successful on a road test. Okay, Corey, uh, why is the class one theory test separate from the air brake test? Are there class one vehicles that use a different braking system? Uh, Corey, that's, that is a good question, <laughs> and no, all Class 1 vehicles use air brakes. I have not encountered any vehicle that does not use air brakes. Uh, it's, it's probably just the evolution of how air brakes came in in the 1970s when they brought it in as a course that had to be uh, done to get your CDL license, so it is different. It's just the way it is. Uh, juice. It was actually a deer that ran on the Beltway. Yes. Uh, okay. I there. I think there was. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, Jaden. Preferred steering method in Minnesota is probably going to be hand over hand. Just ring a local driving school or go down and talk to the DMV. But most places in North America, it's going to be hand over hand. It's not going to be hand to two two hand. There's very few places in the world that are actually hand to hand. Uh, Rashmita, is it okay for the car is parked slightly tilted in between the two white lines and a parking lot as long as the car within the white lines? Yes, it is okay to have the car crooked in the lines as long as you're within the lines. Even if you're not within the lines, the demerits that are going to be assigned are minimal. So don't, you know, stress yourself out trying to get it straight in between the lines, okay? Just do the best you can. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, uh, 6461 is from New Jersey. Uh, Jaden, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> Can you send that to me? School bus had plunged into a pool. I wonder how they managed to do that. Uh, Stephanie, hand over hand. It should be hand over hand in, Miss in Minnesota as well, Stephanie, as far as I know. What I said, uh, just call one of the local driving schools and they'll be able to help you out as well. The other counsel that I give you, if you are preparing for a road test and are going to be taking a road test in the next couple of weeks, call a local driving school and book a practice driving test. That way you can go in, go out with an instructor for 20-25 minutes, 
they will do a practice driving test for you. It's inexpensive. I know that Sam at Rookie Auto Driving School in the Bronx, they only charge $20 for a practice driving test. It is the best $20 you will ever spend because a local driving instructor knows all the nuances and minor points that you need to have in place to be successful on a road test. So they can give you feedback about the skills and abilities that you need to improve to be successful on a road test. And I, I cannot stress this enough that it is important that you take a practice driving test for the purposes of passing your actual road test. Because it's better to know that you didn't pass in a practice driving session, then that way you don't have to rebuild your confidence. You can go home and work on those skills and then go take your driving test and be successful. So I counsel you, take a practice driving test. All the information here on the channel is really great and will help you out, but I can't give you all the minor nuances of the area in which you're going to be taking the road test. And for example, the question I was asked about hand over hand in Mississippi, or Miss Minnesota rather, sorry, two completely different states. <laughs> uh, I can't give you those nuances. It's probably hand over hand, but a local driving instructor will be able to help you out with that. All right, so we're just going to wrap up here. Uh, Hall phase, do you think distracted driving is the number one problem in driving? Uh, no, Hall phase, I don't think distracted driving is the number one problem. What I think the number one problem is is that people failing to yield and uh, following too close. I think those are the two number one reasons because if you manage space around your vehicle and you're not near other people, uh, most people can manage to multitask while they're driving, but they need space because what happens is they run up on other people. They look at their phones or they play with their stereo or they smack their kids at inappropriate times. So I think if you manage space and have a space buffer, uh, you're going to be okay. I think that more than distracted driving, those other two things are more, more, uh, that contribute more to traffic crashes, which is failing to yield and following too close. Okay, Von Sita, I take my driving test on Tuesday. Good luck with that, uh, for sure. Uh, Tommy, I'm in Connecticut. I'm looking into it. Uh, I will send you a comment maybe on this video or I might email about it. Yes, for sure. Okay, uh, Hall Phase, tell us some rules with distracted drivers with big rigs and why they move. Uh, they're more strict with rigs. Well, one of the reasons they're more strict with rigs, uh, Hall Phase, is just because they're supposed to be professional commercial drivers. All right, uh, Sharon is here, hello. And there is Sam, my friend Sam. You are most welcome, Sam. <laughs> you are lurking in the background there. Uh, Jaden, uh, when I see people on YouTube chasing tornadoes and going after, no, sorry, driving forward into the tornado path, do you think they're a little crazy? Uh, yeah, Jaden, I think they're uh, not quite right. <laughs> Vinny, you're most welcome. Stephanie, will I fail my road test for backing up? Most looking in my side mirrors are to do it instead of the back window. No, Stephanie, get, get your hips turned around and look out the back window while you're backing up for the purposes of a road test. Okay, marketplace, there we go. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up there. Expert, my driving test tomorrow, you have any tips? Yes, expert, watch the replay here. I'll get it up tonight for you and uh, look at the four components. And also the four components are in the eight tips to pass a road test, final playlist there. Have a look at that as well. All right, Carson, I was helping my father renovate the yard to make new space for parking a cargo trailer. It was down a grassy hill and I used his pickup to tow the trailer down a hill and I slid 40 feet and had to really release the brakes to turn. <laughs> I'm more by reacting in time. Yes, when you're on slippery conditions and this is applicable to winter driving, uh, steering and braking are two separate actions, all right? So, hall phase, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, have a great week. Uh, there we go. Yes, by all means, uh, Jaden, do that. I've been pretty busy the last couple of weeks, so if, if I don't get to you, send me another email. Just send me a reminder. And uh, Okay, so we're just going to wind it up there for tonight. Good luck to all of you who have a road test coming up. Congratulations to those who have passed in the last couple of weeks, and be sure to head over and sign up for the 100K campaign that we've going on to help 100,000 drivers. Uh, passed the road test in the last week and also all of the drivers who register for the 100k campaign are going in a draw for a hundred dollar fuel card every month okay so know that as well and the webinar air brake webinar on wednesday 1 p.m and i'll put the link up on the community tab okay there we go and naco from albany new york what a great place there we go so thank you so much for showing up thank you for your time and your contributions to the live stream 
Without you, it doesn't happen and you make it even better. So thanks so much for that. Good luck on your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.